The first rule of hill walking is always know where you are. People get lost in the hills when they think they are somewhere where they're not. Paul's writing to this church at Corinth to urge them to check their bearings. Are you sure you really know what you really know where you are? Are you sure you're in a safe place? And God speaks to us for the same reasons. We're going to read the first 11 verses of chapter 15 together. This is how it goes. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Just notice those words in the first couple of verses. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. To stay with the hill walking illustration. Things are relatively easy when the sun shines. The trouble comes when the visibility reduces and the landmarks disappear and disorientation sets in. Here's a couple of things that can disorientate us as Christians. There's a line in a hymn which says, when darkness seems to hide his face. When suffering and difficulty come, the possibility of being disorientated is real and we really need to know where we stand. Just think about the nation of Israel, miraculously rescued by God from Pharaoh's death camps. They ate the Passover, they witnessed the plagues, they passed through the sea on dry land. It must have been a fantastic time. Maybe they thought the long summer holidays had arrived. But rather they found themselves <clears throat> in the wilderness. They were thirsty and hungry. There was threats from enemies. So where were they? <clears throat> had they been chucked out, left to fend for themselves, abandoned by God? Or were they still at the centre of his steadfast love? Or think about this church at Corinth where there's been this major breakdown with their apostle. Notice the way he makes the gospel very personal. The gospel I preach to you, the word I preach to you. It's possible to fall out with the New Testament writers. If you were here last week, we were thinking about the New Testament line on men and women. It's not the most contemporary view today. On another occasion, it might be what it's got to say about issues of sexuality. Paul's Gospel. Are you sure that's all there is? In some ways, Corinth was very modern. We like choice. We like options. Surely you're not claiming that Paul's right and everybody else is wrong. Is that not far too narrow? In other words, to stick with the hill walking analogy, aren't there lots of paths to the top? But I guess hill walking experience would suggest that not all paths lead to the summit. And some of them will get you dangerously lost. So this is a chapter that says, check your bearings. Are you sure you're standing where you think you're standing? Are you sure you're safe? Just look with me then at what it's got to say. First of all, he wants to remind us of the facts of the gospel. Stand firm, he says, on the facts of the gospel. All those words which you received, on which you've taken your stand, those that you hold firmly, things you've believed, are ways of describing faith. But faith always has an object. Faith is in something. Our culture argues that to be a Christian is to believe in fairy stories. We're just indulging in wishful thinking. 
it prompts the question, <clears throat> is it true? Well, here are the facts. Christ died. If there was one thing the Romans were very good at, it was executing people. They didn't leave things to chance. The gospel accounts tell us how surprised they were, how quickly Jesus seemed to have died. But just to make sure, they pierce his side with a spear. He was buried. In the normal course of things, executed criminals weren't buried. They were left on the crosses for the carrion to feast on the flesh. And they were taken down and thrown on the town rubbish dump where the dogs could finish them off. But all four Gospels inform us Jesus was taken down from the cross and buried. All four Gospels tell us the name of the person who did this. And he wasn't a nobody, a nobody. He was a prominent member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Gospels were written between AD 50 and AD 90. In other words, during the lifetime of this man, Joseph of Arimathea. In other words, go and check it out. Go and speak to him. You could go back today to an event that took place 40 years ago and check it out. For instance, the first test tube baby was a girl called Louise Brown, born in 1978. If you read that in a book, you could go and check out those details for yourself. Well, you could do the same with Joseph. And then the, the, the passage goes on. He was raised and he appeared to many witnesses. We're inclined to think, aren't we, that people who lived a long time ago were disposed to believe anything. <clears throat> One of the twelve to whom Jesus appeared was a, an arch-sceptic. Thomas was having none of it when his friends told him that they had seen Jesus alive. Only a personal encounter with the risen Jesus would persuade him to change his mind. But of course, that's what he did and became one of the witnesses of that event. Others are accused of believing what they want. But the last thing the author of this letter wanted a man who by that, at that stage was called Saul of Tarsus and who becomes Paul. The last thing he wanted to believe was that the resurrection was true. His whole life was built on opposing and attacking those who claimed that Jesus was alive. The day he encountered the risen Jesus was the day that his reputation was shredded and his achievements were wiped out. And yet he tells us that Jesus is alive. Notice too that phrase, according to the scriptures. In other words, these things are predicted in the first part of the Bible. A thousand years before Jesus is born, David writes of one who will not be abandoned to shale, who will be allowed to see corruption. The claim of the Gospels is that that has been fulfilled in the events of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So is it true? <clears throat> I would argue today that our culture has become increasingly unrealistic about death. On the one hand, it argues that technology will one day provide us with all the answers. But significantly, as our culture disowns its Christian roots, it seems to become increasingly ready to believe anything. People talk glibly about happy endings. Frank Gardner, who's the BBC defence correspondent, was very nearly murdered in a terrorist attack in Saudi Arabia. Very sadly, his cameraman, Simon Cumbers, did die. But Gardner tells us that when he goes to the memorial service for his cameraman, Simon, he feels as though God, he, Simon is up there somewhere. In his words, although I'm not particularly religious, I had that sense that Simon was up there somewhere, willing me to pick up my journalistic career that had so very easily, that had so nearly been ended. But what is the basis of that? We hear people say that people are up there watching, that their parents are delighted to see their achievements. There seems very little cause to believe those things. And yet here we are, we're looking we're looking at a passage of the scripture that gives us good reason to believe these things. So who's telling the truth? Who do you believe? 
If this is true, it's the best news you could ever hear. Death is the one thing that intervenes to destroy all our hopes. The £100,000 a week footballer is on his way to the old people's home where they'll struggle to get across the room. Glamorous celebrities that adorn the covers of glossy magazines are heading towards the world of grey hair and wrinkles. Fabulous wealth is destined to be abandoned and redistributed. Here's the great news that God has intervened in what seems an unbreakable process. We're part of this process where people die, they're buried, you never see them again. But here is something different that breaks that cycle. Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. So where are you going to stand? On the glib hopes of today, don't worry, everything will be all right. Just avoid a painful departure. Or are you going to pin your hopes to the resurrection of Jesus? That in the resurrection of Jesus, God has struck a decisive blow against our last and greatest enemy. But there is a second thing here. Don't let go of the reason for the gospel. Notice that word of warning in verse 2. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you. And then he tells us what that word was. Not just that Christ rose from the dead, but Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. If the first question is, is it true? The second question has to be, what does it mean? Now, this is a story of a rescue. And everyone loves a rescue. Who can forget those 12 Thai boys and their football coach rescued from that flooded cave complex? Yeah, sure, they were rescued from a dangerous situation. But I guess they were also rescued from bad leadership that had got them there in the first place. People find the idea of needing to be saved from their sin, very strange. If what the Bible was talking about was being saved from dementia or cancer or global warming or terrorism, then I guess we'd all be up for that. But sin really doesn't seem to be an issue. We're surrounded by encouragement to think we're pretty good people. But a bit like the boys in the cave, there is a root cause to all those other things that trouble our lives. Something that happened further back and has brought about this predicament. Adam, humanity's head, led us in a dangerous direction. And we have succumbed in following a sinful lead. Now, here's the thing. Sin arms death. You get a glimpse of the true nature of death through the eyes of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he contemplates what's before him the next day. And what so terrifies him is not so much the process of dying, terrible though that may be, but rather the destination of where it will lead. It's expressed in those words that he will speak on the next day. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's the thing about death. It separates. It becomes that powerful force that separates soul from body, but much more importantly, separates people from God. But here's the truly wonderful thing. In dying as he did, Jesus acts as a representative before God. Christ died for our sins. Now we understand this principle. The largest demonstration ever staged in London was the march against the Iraq war. But we went to war anyway. Because the person who was our representative in these matters, Mr. Blair, our Prime Minister, made the call. And to some effect, to some extent, we were all affected by it. When Jesus is on trial before Pilate, the governor parades him before the crowd, announcing, Behold the man. Pilate speaks better than you. He is the man. He's one of us. He stands before God. On our behalf. If a small child had gone past the execution site with his mother and asked, who is that man? She would have answered, that's a bad man, that's someone going to hell. And of course that would have been the right answer. 
the Old Testament prophets would agree. These are things that the scripture predicts. The prophet Isaiah, 800 years before Jesus, wrote these words that describe exactly what was going on at the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus rescues us from death by rescuing us from sin. It's, an, it's of first importance that you and I see that. I need to confront myself over that. At its simplest, the gospel is a promise. It's a promise of pardon and welcome and a place in the Father's house. But how do you know that God is going to keep that promise? In a word, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me just say one last thing. Not only are we to stand firm on this gospel, not only are we to understand what it's saying, but we are to give ourselves to the work of the gospel. Notice that little phrase in verse two, by which you are being saved. Believing the resurrection to be true doesn't make you a Christian. The Jewish leaders knew that Jesus had risen, but they didn't do anything about it other than pay the guards to keep their mouths shut. The devil knows the resurrection is true, but it doesn't change his outlook in any way. Listen to how Paul speaks here in verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. This is the, so what am I going to do about it, question. The gospel promotes a life of hard work and service. If you think life is a rat race and it's all about the survival of the fittest, then you will pursue your own agenda, plan your pleasures, fight to get what you want. But if you think someone else at great cost to themselves has intervened to turn your life around from eternal disaster to lasting safety, you're certainly going to behave differently. That's what this man means when he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I sometimes feel pretty shaky as I contemplate going in for my next round of chemo. It's all needles and drips and medication that makes you feel nauseous and tired. But it's administered by people who are out to make it as easy and as pleasant as possible. And they provide drugs to minimise the effects. And they're kind, they're thoughtful. And anyway, it's not as though I have any choice in the whole matter. But the people who surrounded Jesus weren't out to minimise the ordeal, indeed the very opposite. He faced not needles but nails. He's put through gratuitous suffering. But most remarkable of all, he has a choice. And he chooses to stay and serve people like us. The cross of Jesus not only saved us from death and hell, it saves us from the selfish life. That's what Paul has been teaching this church in the last three chapters. Spiritual gifts, whatever they might be, are for service. They're not a badge to show I'm superior to other Christians. What's a spiritual navel-gazing goes on as people contemplate what their particular spiritual gift might be and whether or not they might feel fulfilled doing such and such? Wrong question. Rather, just look around and ask yourself what needs to be done. Who's standing on their own, needing someone to talk to? Are those doing the work amongst the children really stretched? Do the chairs need putting away? But why will we not serve in this kind of way? I guess the answer is because it doesn't seem to matter. There's no prizes for putting the chairs away. No pats on the back for talking to strangers or inviting them home for lunch. Nobody sees, or do they? 
The resurrection means everything matters. The resurrection means your labour in the Lord is never in vain. He sees and he will reward. So have you got the questions in your head that arise out of this passage this morning? We're being asked to check our bearings, to find out if we're in a safe place. Is it true? That's the first question. Has Jesus really risen from the dead? Is there enough evidence in these words that we just read together to convince us that these things really happened. And then what does it mean? Is my sin really my biggest problem? And has Jesus by his death provided me with a way out? Finally, so what are you going to do about it? Don't let these things be without effect. Let them motivate you to trust and serve Christ.